We just got a huge victory in the ages old question is can I exercise my God-given right to keep and bear arms across a fake dotted line on a map? And it all, of, it all happened in the communist nation called Massachusetts, one of the most anti-gun states in the union, and it's phenomenal. You're gonna want to watch this case. You're gonna want to check this video out because this might be the case that destroys all the craziness. All right, let's get into this decision in, of all places, Massachusetts, where a resident of New Hampshire was, uh, was in Massachusetts and got jammed up because they didn't have a Massachusetts governmental permission slip called an LTC or a license to carry a firearm, and they were charged with that. So they challenged the constitutionality of Massachusetts's laws, <laughs> uh, and Bruin destroyed them. I'm going to read this decision from the judge. It's quick, but it's majestic. Stay with me. This happened at the Lowell District Court, and uh, the judge said, the defendant, Dean Donnell, is charged in the Lowell District Court with carrying a firearm without a license under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 269, Section 10A Alpha. The defendant has filed a motion to dismiss the charge in the complaint claiming that one, that law is unconstitutional on its face, two, it's unconstitutional as applied to the defendant, and three, it violates the defendant's right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. That's a fantastic angle to take legally. The defendant in his memorandum in support advances arguments that 269.10a impermissibly infringes on the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. Two, it impermissibly shifts the burden of proof onto the defendant to prove he was in fact licensed. Three, requiring non-residents to obtain licenses to carry firearms violates the Second Amendment because there is no historical analog burdening the right to interstate travel. Four, the holding of Commonwealth v. Harris in 2019 does not survive constitutional muster and is inapplicable to the defendant's case. And five, the defendant's right to equal protection and the right to travel has been violated. All of these are phenomenal ways to attack Massachusetts's gun control laws. The facts leading up to the issuance of the complaint are not in dispute, and for the purposes of this motion, the court accepts them. Those facts are contained in both the Commonwealth's memorandum in opposition to the motion to dismiss, as well as the defendant's memorandum in support of addendum to the motion to dismiss. There is no question that the holding of the United States Supreme Court in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, Inc. v. Bruin of 2022 has changed the legal landscape on how the Second Amendment of the Constitution is interpreted, particularly how it affects existing firearm statutes and challenges to their constitutionality. In fact, the SJC, which is the Massachusetts' Supreme Judicial Court in Commonwealth v. Guardada in 2023, recognized for the first time that the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees an individual's right to possess and carry a firearm outside of his home. Prior to Guardado, Massachusetts treated the possession of carrying a firearm outside of one's home as a privilege that was conferred on a person by the state. It was against the Bruin backdrop that the SJC reversed the long-standing law in Massachusetts that licensure to possess a firearm was not an essential element of the felony of unlawful possession of a firearm outside of the home. Massachusetts had previously required that holding a valid license to carry a firearm was an exception to the otherwise prohibition of carrying a firearm, and that requiring the defendant to produce a license at trial did not infringe on constitutionally protected conduct. Because the SJC has already addressed the burden-shifting claim made by the defendant, the five remaining arguments of the defendant can be summarized as follows. This is where it gets good. What effect does the Bruin decision have on the status of an ordinary, law-abiding resident of the state of New Hampshire who exercises his constitutional right under the Second Amendment while traveling in Massachusetts? Bruin articulated a two-step analysis in determining whether a law or regulation of constitutionally protected conduct is unconstitutional. First, courts must determine whether the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct. If so, then the Constitution presumptively protects that conduct, and the government must justify its regulation by demonstrating that it is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. To carry its burden, the government must point to historical precedent from before, during, and even after the founding that evinces a comparable tradition of regulation. 
Only then may a court conclude that the individual's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment's unqualified command. The conduct of the defendant in the instant case clearly is covered by the Second Amendment. Therefore, the burden falls on the Commonwealth to justify the law showing that it is consistent with the country's tradition of firearm regulation. As the defendant in the instant case is not a resident of Massachusetts and was in compliance with his home state's laws on the possession of a firearm, the Commonwealth needed to show some historical analog relating to disparate treatment of non-residents and must point to some historical precedent from before, during, and even after the founding that invinces a comparable tradition of regulation. The Commonwealth argues that under the holding in Commonwealth v. Harris, Massachusetts is not obligated to recognize any out-of-state right to carry a firearm under the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution. They claim that the Commonwealth is not required to substitute its statutes for those of New Hampshire, and Bruin does not affect the ability of states to require a license as long as the license criteria are objective. This argument is not persuasive because at the time of the Harris decision, carrying a firearm outside of the home was a privilege in Massachusetts, and the Harris court held that Massachusetts didn't have to give the full faith and credit to New Hampshire laws conferring the same privilege. The Commonwealth is correct that concurring opinion in Bruin did state that the ability of states to require a license is not affected, but the holding in Bruin basically took away all subjective criteria for the issuance of such license. The Commonwealth points to no historical precedent limiting the reach of one's exercise to a federal constitutional right to only within that resident's state's borders. Moving on to the defendant's claim that 269.10a violates the defendant's right to travel and equal protection, the Commonwealth also asserts that it does not violate the right to travel and equal protection clause because the Commonwealth's license requirements do not prohibit him from traveling in Massachusetts. They only prohibit him from carrying a firearm while traveling in Massachusetts. The Commonwealth further argues that the licensing requirements don't treat non-residents differently than a resident because they can apply for a temporary non-resident license to carry or they can travel throughout the state while complying with the statutory exemptions of unloading the firearm and storing it secured in a locked compartment and the travel is for a specific purpose such as training or competition. The Commonwealth points to the Massachusetts Firearm Licensing Scheme to argue that a non-resident can travel in Massachusetts with a firearm without a license if they are in compliance with the exceptions as listed. However, the exceptions miss the point of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment and the right to possess a firearm is for personal protection and self-defense. The exemptions strip away the right by disarming the individual while he is traveling within the state. The Commonwealth does not point to any historical precedent for this. The Commonwealth's argument against the defendant's claim that 269.10a violates his rights under the Equal Protection Clause because he can obtain a temporary non-resident license to carry is also unpersuasive. As stated above, prior to the Bruin decision, Massachusetts treated the carrying of a firearm as a privilege. While it allowed non-residents to apply to obtain a license for that privilege, non-residents were not treated the same as residents. Residents of Massachusetts obtaining a license were granted the license for five years. A temporary non-resident license was only valid for one year and it cost $100 per year. The Commonwealth next argues that the Massachusetts licensing scheme imposes a permissible burden because of all the substantial state interest in preventing certain people from possessing firearms. However, under federal law, certain people are prohibited from obtaining and possessing firearms. That's 18 U.S.C. 922G, which is also being challenged on its constitutionality. And that makes it unlawful for certain categories of persons to ship, transport, receive, or possess firearms or ammunition to include any person and these are the things that make you a prohibited person. Nothing in the Bruin decision is contrary to the argument raised by the Commonwealth that there is a substantial interest in making it unlawful for certain individuals to possess firearms. In fact, throughout the Bruin decision, reference is made to ordinary law-abiding citizens when speaking of the rights under the Second Amendment. The logical conclusion of the Commonwealth's argument is that an ordinary law-abiding resident of the state of New Hampshire can become a felon merely by traveling into the state of Massachusetts. Given that there is already a federal law applying to the entire country as to who is prohibited from possessing firearms, the court is not persuaded by the argument. And in conclusion, a law-abiding resident of New Hampshire who is exercising his constitutional right should not become a felon by exercising that right while he is traveling through Massachusetts merely because he has not obtained a Massachusetts license to carry, which now, under the holding of Bruin, 
has to be issued to an applicant unless the applicant is otherwise disqualified. The standard for who is a disqualified individual must be the same. Otherwise, a state may decide to impose indifferent requirements on the exercise of any constitutional right. For example, some states could impose different age limits on voting in elections. This court can think of no other constitutional right which a person loses simply by traveling beyond his home state's border into another state continuing to exercise that right and instantaneously becomes a felon subject to mandatory minimum sentence of incarceration. Anecdotally, the law-abiding New Hampshire resident exercising his constitutional right to carry while shopping at the Pheasant Tree Mall in Nashua, New Hampshire, would become a felon when he shops in a section of a store at that mall, which happens to be in Tingsboro, Massachusetts. That mall is on the state's border. An individual only loses a constitutional right if he commits an offense or is or has been engaged in certain behavior that is covered by 18 U.S.C. 922. He doesn't lose that right simply by traveling into an adjoining state whose statute mandates that residents of that state obtain a license prior to exercising their constitutional right. To hold otherwise would inexplicitly treat Second Amendment rights differently than any other individual held rights. Therefore, the court finds that Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 269, Section 10A, is unconstitutional as applied to this particularly situated defendant and allows the motion to dismiss on that grounds. This is a huge decision. Now, I love it when Massachusetts gets beaten and, and just pummeled for their unconstitutional ways. I don't know, I've spent a lot of time in that state and it, it's, I, I know how bad the laws are. And I'm glad that they're finally, finally being challenged based off of Bruin. Uh, you know, a year and a half. I, personally, I think it should have all started a year and a half ago in June of 2022. But this is great. This judge has said, you can't just you know, lock somebody up because they come into your kingdom, your fiefdom, exercising a constitutionally guaranteed right. You're wrong, Massachusetts. And this is phenomenal. Uh, you know, Massachusetts has a license to carry firearms. You have to pay the government to get a card that says you can carry a gun. That is unconstitutional, but the licensing scheme is allowed to continue. It's, they, they claim it's for background checks and the, and the process of fingerprinting and all that crazy horseshit. Um, but yeah, we've all, we, we're all on the same boat. Like the dotted lines on a map, my rights don't end there. And the second amendment doesn't either. This judge hammered that home. This judge eviscerated Massachusetts law that says, if you come into our state, you had better get a license to carry. Uh, if you're not a prohibited person, you're good to go. And this is awesome. This is great news. Massachusetts, this is one of many that are going to fall, trust me. And if you're in Massachusetts, join me this weekend at Goal, that's Gun Owners Action League's uh, event that they're holding in Quincy, uh, where we're trying to stop the other law that Massachusetts is trying to put in, and that is the biggest, worst uh, anti-gun bill I've ever seen in my career. It takes all of the laws from California, New Jersey, New York, you name it, bundles it all in one, and then they one-up it. It's crazy, it bans everything. Uh, there's retroactive bans, it's terrible. Uh, I'll be there talking uh, at uh, Goals event. I'll have a link down below if you live in Massachusetts. Get a ticket, come say hi. All right, y'all, I'll see you on the next one. This is phenomenal news, a big win by a judge in Massachusetts. Somebody protect that judge. I'll see you on the next one, take care.